Today we're in Psalms 111 through 113. Let's begin reading together here in Psalm 111 at verse 1. It's only got 10 verses, and so we'll read through the 10 verses and get into our study. Uh, Beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 10, Psalm 111, praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and His righteousness endures forever. He has made His wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear Him. He will ever be mindful of His covenant. He has declared to His people the power of His works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of His hands are verity and justice. All His precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. So as we look at Psalms 111 through 113, let me give you a couple of thoughts. One is these three psalms that we'll be looking at uh, tonight are all anonymous. But what you see here is really three psalms that continue a, um, a praise to the Lord. Psalm 111, 112, and 113 are all psalms that praise the Lord for His works of grace, for His compassion, for the blessings that He has provided, as well as His grace. And that's what we'll be looking at today as we look at these three psalms. We're looking at psalms that are written that are intended to bring praise to the Lord. Now, notice in verse 1 how he begins by simply saying, Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. First, there's a general call here. When he says, Praise the Lord, that's really a call to people everywhere, that that every, every person everywhere is encouraged to bring praise to God. And so, praise to God is given. And it's not only when we're alone... But it also includes times that we gather together, even as we have tonight. You praise the Lord in your secret place, in your closet, in, in your home. But you also praise the Lord when, we, when you're with your friends. And uh, that helps us to remember that praise to God isn't something that we do simply by ourselves. Every person who loves the Lord is called by God to offer praise to Him. In Psalm 106, verse 48, the Scripture says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say amen, praise the Lord. And so notice he says, praise the Lord. It's a general call. But then secondly, he says, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. Not only do we have an encouragement to praise the Lord as a community, but then again, we have a call to praise the Lord individually, and we also have a call to praise the Lord completely with a full commitment to Him. You praise the Lord with everything. So our worship to God is to be from an undivided heart. In other words, do not allow anything to distract or take away from your loyalty to the Lord. Let nothing take away from your love for Him. So he says we are to praise the Lord with our whole heart or an undivided heart. The Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 says, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. We love the Lord with our intellect, we love the Lord with our emotions, and we love the Lord with our energies. You love the Lord with everything that is within you, and as you have that love for God, and it grows, by the way, day in and day out, it grows through experience with Him, it grows through just living in a relationship with Him day by day, and as it continues to grow, you give more of yourself to Him, you're more committed to Him over time, and that's what He's called us to do. And we rejoice before the Lord, and we praise the Lord with everything that is within us. Zephaniah, an Old Testament prophet, in chapter 3, verse 14, writes, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. And so the Lord has called us to be committed to Him. The Lord has called us to be committed to Him in a complete and full way, and to love God with all of our heart, and to praise God with everything that is within us. That's what God calls us to do. No man can serve two masters, Jesus taught us. Either you will hold fast to one and cling to the other, or you'll despise one. The fact is, is you have to make choices. You have to decide who it is that you're going to serve. As for us, we make the decision that we'll serve the Lord. Now that we have made that decision to serve the Lord, 
we make a decision to serve the Lord with everything that is within us, with no sense of compromise. The other day I was at home and I was listening to some music. There's a tribute, an album. It's called A Tribute to, um, to Keith Green. I don't even know if anybody here even remembers Keith Green, but some of you perhaps remember him, but he's an oldie but goodie. And Keith Green um, was known uh, in the early Jesus movement as a man who had a tremendous love for the Lord. And in my early days as a Christian, some of the songs that he sang uh, were lodged in my heart. And the attitude that he had um, during that time of no compromise really spoke to me. And, and I have um, a couple of albums uh, that I have. One is a tribute to Keith Green, meaning that it's songs that were written by and performed by Keith Green that are actually performed by other artists, other Christians. And I also have his, his music where he sings his own music and all. And I was in my room and I had the, uh, the music playing and I was just seated in, in my uh, chair that I have there by my desk and all. And, and as I was listening to his music, my son David walked into the room. And my son, as he walked into the room, uh, began to speak to me and he was listening to the song that I was listening to at that time. And I began to share some things with him about the life of this man, Keith Green. I said, you know, Dave, um, Keith Green died as a young man. Uh, he died in 1982. It turns out he was 28 years old at the time when he died. And I said, you know, he only had a few years that he served the Lord, but I knew him as a man of no compromise. As a matter of fact, when Keith Green died, he actually had overloaded a small plane and was flying with supplies to um, deliver to those who had need uh, from his base in Texas and was flying into Mexico. And because the plane was overloaded with all the supplies, the plane went down. And when the plane went down, Keith Green died. Not only did Keith Green die, I said, but he died with his little boy, Josiah, who was three years old. And he died with his little girl, Bethany, who was two. And I said, I can still remember when I came home that day and I heard on the news that Keith Green had died. I said, I can still remember being in my car in the driveway at my house and I can remember just turning the car off and crying there in the driveway and then walking in and telling my wife Keith Green died. And Marie and I cried because he was a tremendous minister. And, and so I was playing this particular song uh, to him uh, so that he could hear the music of Keith Green. And, and little did I know that when I left to go to, to the office, my son went back into the room and turned the song on again and listened to it one more time. Because, and then he came and spoke to me, and he said, you know, Dad, I went on the Internet, and I opened up the web page that speaks about Keith Green, and I read about him, and I ordered a book, and I ordered some of his music. He said, but that music that you were playing, that song that you were playing, he, he said, as I was listening to it, and this, was, I thought, was a wonderful observation. He said it was on the tribute album. He said the, the one who was singing the song was singing the song, but it was a tribute to Keith Green. But when at the end of the song you hear Keith Green's voice, they actually bring his voice in after this other individual has performed his song, and it closes really with Keith Green closing that song. He said you could hear that Keith Green was singing a tribute to Jesus and the singer was singing a tribute to Keith Green. You could see the difference. And I said, that's extremely observant, son. That's exactly what took place. He was singing Keith Green's song, but Keith Green was singing to the Lord. You know, some of us, guys, some of us sing songs, and some of us sing songs to the Lord. Some of us sing songs to the person in front of us because we're concerned they're going to hear our voice. And maybe we should be concerned, but we'll talk about that some other time. But sometimes we sing the Lord to the Lord with all of our heart. And there is a difference, and you know it. It's, there is a difference between knowing a song and knowing the one it's being sung to. We've been called by the Lord to praise Him with all of our heart, not with a divided heart, not with divided attention, but with a loyalty for Him. And we love the Lord. We love Him with all of our emotions. We love Him with all of our intellect. We love Him with all of our energies. And as we do that, and as we're praising the Lord, that's what it means to praise Him with our whole heart. I encourage you, as, as we are here, I encourage you to take the opportunity to open your heart up to the Lord in worship as we sing. And, and as the Word is divided, to open your heart up and say, God, speak to my heart, that I might hear what you have to say to me today, that I might live in such a way that I bring glory to you. 
Our worship is to be in an open and loving fashion to him. And sometimes it is in the assembly of the upright. It is in the congregation. In Psalm 109, verse 30, the scripture says, I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. I will praise him among the multitude. Now, in verses 2 and 3, the works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. And so notice he says the works of the Lord are, are great, and they are studied by all who have pleasure in them. So God's works are awe-inspiring. That's the point he's making. And therefore, they must be studied by those who love him. That word studied is an interesting word. It means to be investigated or practiced. It means to seek something out, to resort to. It speaks of inquiring or applying. In other words, his works are to be meditated on, and pursuing God should be the chief delight of a person who has relationship with him. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 139, verse 14 says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Notice in verse 3 how it says his work is honorable and glorious and his righteousness endures forever. And when it speaks of his nature, uh, his work being honorable and glorious, it speaks concerning the fact that nature declares the incredible majesty and power of God. But also his honor, glory, and righteousness reveal his character. Those are his moral attributes. And so nature can declare the reality that there is a great and powerful God, but God declares to us through his works not only through those in creation, but the things that he, that he is, his attributes, it reveals to us what a wonderful God we have and what a wonderful God we worship. In Jeremiah 32, 17 through 19, the Bible says, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There's nothing too hard for you. You show loving kindness to thousands, repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. You are great in counsel, mighty in work, for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. And so the great and powerful God is the one that we worship. In verse 4 through 6, he says, He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. In other words, as amazingly powerful and awesome as God is, he is also gracious and he is also compassionate. God's love and power are revealed through his grace. And when we fall in love with the Lord, as, as terrible and awesome as God is and is declared to be in Scripture, we have that wonderful relationship of being his child in his mighty arms. A few years ago, there was an, an ad, uh, a commercial on TV. I wish I could, I could uh, remember all the details of it, but it struck me in one way, and it was this. There was an enormous football player, a, a giant of a man. He was an enormous man in this particular commercial. And uh, he has his shirt off, as I recall, and very, very enormous. He's obviously a professional athlete, perhaps, and more than likely a lineman on a professional football team, an enormously big and powerful man. But the commercial have had him holding his baby, and his baby was just a tiny little infant in his hands. And you see this enormous, powerful man that could rip the, you know, the doors off a refrigerator, you know, a man that doesn't, you know, just an enormous man, but in his hands is cradled his son. And as I was looking at that ad, I thought to myself, what a picture of restraint. What a picture of power. What a, what a picture of, of, of a man who would, you know, I wouldn't want to get in between him and his son. Let's just put it that way. A man that is incredibly powerful, and yet he's holding tenderly this little baby that obviously is the delight of his heart. And the Lord used that image to me to remind me that I have an awesome and powerful God who is my father and that he holds me in his hand. And so, so God is, is terrible in might, and he's awesome in power, but he's also compassionate and loving. So his power is revealed to us in his love, not in that he can terrify us, but that he loves us. There's a scripture in the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. And in Hosea chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, listen to what the Lord says. God said, I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms. 
but they did not know that I healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love, and I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and I fed them. This is a picture of the Lord who actually teaches a people to walk, even as Marie, my wife, and I uh, did the same for our children, for our four kids, as they were learning to toddle and all, how that we would stoop down and we would put our hands out to them and, and how we would take them and how we protected them as they, as they went through life. Uh, just the other day on Sunday, uh, I was out here after third service and uh, I was holding my grandson, Josiah, who's a year and a half, and... And as I was holding him, I put him down for a moment, and I was standing here at the edge of the platform, and I put my grandson down, and, and the minute I put him down, you know, he starts looking around, and it's, it's time to run. And he starts to run on the edge of this platform right here, and man, I was on him, you know, as fast as an old man can run. And I said, Josiah, you know, and so here comes everybody running to converge on this one little guy. And those are the lessons that the Lord uses in my own life. It's like this. He says, as evil as you are, and I indeed am evil. You don't have to say amen because it's true. As evil as I am, I still have a love for this little one to the point that, you know, I'm concerned that he's even going to trip and bump himself. The other day he was at our house. And as he was uh, with us, I was talking to Marie, my wife, and I was in the kitchen. Josiah has these little, little uh, slippers that he has that doesn't have any, uh, the soles don't have any grip on them. They're his little slippers that he wears with his pajamas. And, and I was standing, and what he chose to do is he chose to kind of squeeze through my legs like they were a bridge or something, and he'd slide through them, and then he'd turn around, and he'd do the same. And he was enjoying himself, and he's, he's a very happy little baby, so he's laughing. But as he's doing that, I looked up to Marie for a moment, and as I was telling her something, he tried to slide in again, and his feet slipped out from underneath him, and as they slipped out, his little head just flattened right on the, on the, on the, the floor, on the tiled floor. And I was on him in a heartbeat, you know, and I picked him up, and he's got a bump in his head. And you want to know something? Shades of what I used to feel like when my children would get hurt. My eyes began to well with tears. Marie's eyes well with tears. I'm kissing his face and holding him, and he's clinging to me. All of those are lessons that the Lord reminds me of, of how he feels towards us. You know, if you love your babies, if you love those who love you, um, God loves you even much more than that. And he's compassionate. He's filled with grace. He takes care of us. That's what it means in verse 5. He's given food to those who fear him. He'll, he'll, he, will, he will ever be mindful of his covenant. In other words, he had promised to do so, and he keeps his promise. Psalm 103, verse 13 says, As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. In verses 7 through 9, the works of his hands are verity. That word verity means truth. The works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. So God's works as well as his words can be depended on. He is also our redeemer. He keeps his word to save those who call upon him. That's something that you can trust him in because the scripture tells us in Psalm 50, verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. You shall glorify me. He keeps his word. So we call on the Lord when we have need and, and he helps us. Now in verse 9, I'm just going to touch this very briefly. Uh, notice verse 9, it says, he has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. If you have a King James Bible, and some of you perhaps do. If you have a King James Bible, the word awesome there is actually the word reverend. You might find that interesting. I'll just say this briefly. Reverend. The word reverend means awesome. The word reverend means to inspire reverence or to inspire godly fear or awe. It speaks of respect. There is only one person in the entire universe that ought to be called reverend, and that's God. I find it odd how man creates these titles for sinful men. And so you have the very reverent, or the very, very reverent, or you have the man I am so reverent. I mean, there are, you see this sometimes. I, I've seen title after title, the very, very most reverent, reverent. There is only one reverent. Sometimes people will ask me, it doesn't happen that much anymore, 
but it happened early in our, our ministry. Uh, whenever I would be doing interviews or whatever, people would ask me, what do you want us to call you in this article? And I, they'd say, Reverend? I said, absolutely not. Uh, no, what do you want to be referred to? I said, well, my name's David. You know, I, I don't mind being called by my name, you know. Okay, but what title do you want? Well, if there's any title that I have, you know, you can call me pastor if you'd like, but why don't you want to be called Reverend? Well, there's only one who is Reverend, and that's the Lord. And, and we need to understand that. And so he says, holy and awesome, or reverent is his name. And finally, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A, a good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. When he says the fear of the Lord, we need to remember that that is the principal part of knowledge because it reveals a reverential submission to God. You see, wisdom in heathen thought does not begin with fearing God because unbelievers don't fear God. And so for them, wisdom would not begin with the fear of the Lord. The Bible tells us in Psalm 36, 1 through 4, uh, concerning the sinner, there's no fear of God before his eyes, for in his own eyes he flatters himself too much to detect or hate his sin. The words of his mouth are wicked and deceitful. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. Even on his bed he plots evil. He commits himself to a sinful course and does not reject what is wrong. And so the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The understanding of the power, majesty, and might of God produces within us a sense of humility. When you understand that God is great and you're not, it will do something for your life. And so the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is man's all. And so the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Psalm 112, beginning at verse 1. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of e evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted with honor. The wicked will see it and be grieved. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. And so he begins here with praise once again. So the emphasis of this psalm is praising God for his righteousness. He also praises the Lord because of the great blessings God has given to those who fear him. Notice in verse 1 how he says, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. He begins by pointing out that the person blessed by God actively pursues the Lord. The one who loves the Lord and is blessed by him is the one who loves God's word. As we pursue him and seek him, we're actually looking for his word. That's what it means when it says, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. Now, notice verse 2 and 3, his descendants will be mighty on earth. The righteous man often is blessed in many ways. His children will achieve greatness, wealth, and riches very often are given to them. And also, because he's righteous, the generation following can be blessed also. Now, godliness has its rewards in this life as well as in future generations. And that's one of the reasons why we as, as parents, those of us who are parents, that's one of the reasons why we raise our children in the fear of the Lord, because we know that God wants to bless our children. And yet, as we look at this in verse 4, I want to spend a moment looking at verse 4 with you. Notice what he says. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Now, in verse 3, he had said, Wealth and riches will be in his house. His righteousness endures forever. But then in verse 4, he says, Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. Fearing the Lord sometimes, and I want to speak to you about this for a few minutes. I'm going to share a few thoughts with you about this. Fearing the Lord sometimes uh, doesn't, well, it sometimes doesn't appear to produce the blessings that we just read. 
When you read verse 2, his descendants will be mighty. When you read verse 3, wealth and riches will be in his house. His righteousness endures forever. But sometimes when you fear the Lord, those things aren't quite obvious to you at first. As a matter of fact, they may not seem obvious through most of your walk with the Lord. As a matter of fact, you may find yourself walking in, in what would feel like in a fog often. It's obviously true that we actually encounter pain and affliction. And the point he's making is even when we enter into that time of darkness, we go through adversity, light still shines on us. There is always going to be the opportunity of light in darkness. One of the things the Lord taught me, and I'm going to give you three scriptures here and share something very practical, hopefully practical with, with you. One of the things the Lord taught me is this, is that we can go through hard times, but that the Lord is with us through them all. In uh, Psalm 23, in verse 4, the psalmist said this. He said, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It's one thing to be able to quote Scripture, and I think that we need to be able to, by the way, it's one thing to be able to quote Scripture to somebody when they're going through a hard time. And many of us are quick to do that, and I think very often because the Word is life, it is necessary for us to encourage with God's healing Word people who have broken hearts. It's one thing, though, to be able to quote the Scripture. It's another thing to learn the meaning of that Scripture yourself. And uh, I have known over the years, especially when I was younger, I have known some who are capable of quoting Scripture but really aren't capable of walking in the shoes of the person they're quoting the Scripture to. And what happens is, unintentionally, you can come off calloused. And there have been a lot of times that I, over the years, have had opportunity to minister. You know, out of the 54 years that I've I've been alive out of the 54 years that I have, have lived, 34 of those years have been walking with the Lord, and 31 of those years has been teaching His Word. But when you consider that when I first began to teach the Bible, I was only 23 years old. I was less than four years old in Christ, and I was a first-year student at a Christian Bible college, and two of those years had been spent in the military. And so I was extremely young in my faith and extremely inexperienced. Not only that, but I was also immature in many ways. And over the years, I have discovered some things, and I've discovered those things through study, through prayer, through experience, that, that I can now bring in my Bible studies and bring in my life that I didn't have as a young man. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why Paul said that we shouldn't have a novice in the position of leadership because he is more susceptible at that point to, uh, to pride, to be puffed up and lifted up and all. Because when you're young, sometimes you can use the Scriptures not so much as, as a scalpel that the Lord uses to, to remove some, some terrible growth in a person's life, but sometimes you can use it as a sword and basically chew somebody up with it, not intending to. It wasn't until recently that the Lord finally began in my life to, to wake me up to, to verse 4 where it says, uh, unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. Because through the, through the series of experiences my wife and I encountered in the loss of those we loved and the various other things that we saw, I began to understand what it means to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I began to realize that it's very possible to love the Lord and still have times of affliction and sorrow, uh, times that you might, um, you know, go to bed with such a, such a heavy burden that you might even, even cry yourself to sleep. Uh, there, are, there are times that, that, that you, you, you begin to wonder, Lord, are you even there? In times of crisis where your faith is put on the line, and, and it is a time of darkness. It's a time where you're saying, Lord, I just, don't, I, I just, I just need a glimmer of hope right now. I, I just need to know 
that you really are with me. I've shared this with you before when my father went home to be with the Lord and, and we were all there at the uh, forest lawn and, and my dad's casket is there and my dad's there in this casket and he's in this suit that my dad never really wore suits and there he is dressed up in a suit and I'm looking at my father and, um, you know, looking at the shell of who was my father. My father's with the Lord, obviously, but I'm looking at the one, the body there that contained who my dad is and all. And, and as I was looking at that, and we're talking amongst ourselves, my mom and my brother and sisters and Marie, my wife and my kids, and, and, and I remember standing up and walking up to the casket and looking down into the face of the one I called father all of my life, of course, and, and the thought hits me. And, and, and it was one of those moments in my life where the Lord really spoke to me. The thought hit me, uh, if there is no such place as heaven, then I'll never see my father again. And I began to think about that thought, and I began to realize how many funerals I've done over the years, how many times I've stood at a graveside, how many times I've taken a widow's hand or, or a mother who's lost a son or, you know, uh, whatever. And, I, you know, I, I've talked to them and I've shared with them and, and ministered to them and wept with them, you know, and... And now, now the words that I've been speaking to others, well, those words have to be spoken to my own heart. And I have to receive sustenance from those words. I have to bring, be, receive comfort and all. And, and, and that's when the word of the Lord really, really became more alive to me because it became one of those uh, either-or situations. Either it is true or you ought to stop preaching it. Because some of us, can get into the point in our lives that, that we might glibly say something without really understanding what we're saying. I was very, very affected by a story that was told to us when I was at Biola by a, a missionary, a missionary who had done his, most of his ministry as a young man, grew up as, to, to, uh, as, a, as a boy, grew up into a young, as a young man in a particular place in India. I've shared this with you before. He spoke at one of our chapels. And I remember how he spoke about how a young man had come to his office as a, he was a young pastor there in this village in India, and the young man said to him, I want to speak to you about Jesus Christ. And the uh, missionary said, would, would you like to know? And he said, I just need to know whether the things that you're saying are true. And so he began to share with him the gospel, and as he went through the gospel, he ended up by saying to this young man, um, would you like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? And, and the young man speaking to, to the missionary pastor said to him, you don't know what it'll cost me. And uh, the missionary pastor says to him, yes, I do. I know what it will cost you because there is a cost that's involved in, in discipleship. And he began to share some of the costs that, it, that is required to follow the Lord. And as, as he shared these things to him, the young man shook his head and, and said to the missionary, you really don't understand what it's going to cost me if I follow this Jesus whom you are preaching. And he says, well, I may not understand, but, but do you want to receive Christ as Lord and Savior? And the young man said to this man, yes, I, I believe that I will. So he says, the missionary sharing with us says that they bow their head and he leads this young man to faith in Christ. And the young man departs from his room. Now, a few days later, there's a knock at his door in his office, and there are some police officers standing at the door, and they say to him, we, we need you to come with us. And so they take him in the police car, and they drive on down into a village road, and, and they're off the side of the road. And he says, and I climb out of the back seat, and they say, we need you to come over here, please. And he walks over, and he says, and as I walk there to the side of the road, he says, there's a tarp over something. And, and they said, we need you to identify somebody for us, please. And, and they pull back the tarp, and, and there's this man, this young man that he had led to Christ three or four days before, and his head had been severed from his body. And he says, and I was looking into the face of this young man that I had prayed with, and I was remembering what he had said to me when he said, you don't know what it will cost me to follow Jesus Christ. And he said, at that moment, as I was looking into the face of this young man, the voice of the Lord spoke to my heart and asked me a question. Do you believe what you told him? Because if you do not believe, then you killed him. You know, what we bring to people is hope in a very dark time. And I believe that God wants us as believers to realize that there is light in our darkness, that you aren't going to always be walking in the valley of the shadow of death. 
and that the Lord will meet you there. And he allows these things in our lives, even though we want to be blessed. In a moment before, he's saying, his descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. His righteousness endures forever. And then he goes on and says, unto the upright there arises light in the darkness because he is gracious and compassionate. And part of the way that the Lord brings us to maturity and knowledge and experience is allowing us to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. In Psalm 42, 8, the Bible says, The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me. Isaiah 61, 3 says that God sent his son Jesus to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And so the Lord is with us, blessing us in every aspect of our lives, even when we go through hard times because, as it says here in verse 4, because he is gracious, he is filled with compassion, and he is righteous. Now, as that works in our life, verse 5, it actually produces a certain kind of person. Verse 5, a good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. So a person who is being touched by the Lord in all of this is going to be concerned, going to be concerned with those who are in need. Not only are you blessed by the Lord, you've gone through affliction, and you know both being in want or being in plenty. You understand how God works, and therefore you get, you get concerned with those who have needs. He lends to the poor, and he doesn't make a profit off of them. Notice in verse 5 how it says, a good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Um, you're not taken for granted. You're not ripped off by somebody who comes and, and is a, a, a con person, but you basically just, well, you give to them as they have need, and the Lord blesses you as you do so. Now, in verse 6, he says, Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He'll not be afraid till he sees his desire upon his enemies. And though they may encounter surprises and though we may have trials, we remain unshaken because we know ultimately that we are ending up victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ. Proverbs 28, verse 1 says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. In Romans, in chapter 8, verse 37, the Bible says, In all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. And the psalmist in Psalm 118, verse 6 said, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Notice verse 9. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted with honor. The wicked will see it and be grieved. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. And so generosity and compassion are the earmarks of the righteous. I was speaking to um, Lance Cook, pastor of Calvary Chapel, La Habra. We'll be going on a ministry trip to, uh, to Thailand, to the island of Phuket in southern Thailand in a couple of weeks. And I had mentioned to him how our fellowship has responded so generously to the victims of this tsunami. And I mentioned to him that, that we were able to send a, a substantial amount through Gospel for Asia, and that we right now still have several thousand dollars that came in. I said that we're going to be earmarking for the tsunami. As we were speaking, the tsunami victims, as we were speaking, Lance said, you know, when we get to the island of uh, Phuket, he said, there are, there are numerous orphans. He said, numerous orphans there right now. And some of you already know this. He said, and, and there are churches that are coming in and ministering. As a matter of fact, we have a very large team that's going to be going in there to minister. And he said, most of the ministry we'll be doing for the five days that we're going to be there, he said, is going to be to ministers who are in the process of ministering right now who need relief and need to be ministered to because they're just, they're just serving 24 hours a day, basically. And he says, and they need some help, and we're going to come alongside them. But as we were speaking, I said, you know, we still have some money that we're going to be sending. And he said, listen, this is something we're going to do. And I'm telling you this because this is something you're doing right now. And so you need to know what you're doing. Um, he said, we, we're going to be putting together some teams, construction teams, to 
to go down into the island. And he said, we need finances, obviously, in order that we can put these things together. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using the finances that have come in. We've already sent uh, a great, great amount of money to Gospel for Asia, but we're going to take the rest of it and we're going to use it to buy, to buy construction tools and, and all kinds of things to build orphanages. That's what we're going to do. And so when we're there, I'm going to be looking for places along with this team that we can erect a, an orphanage or more than one. And that's where your finances are going to go to. The Bible teaches us very, very clearly, and I want you to see this in verse 9, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor. That's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. When you marked that uh, tsunami and you just put whatever it is that you wanted, you are actually giving to the poor. And one of the interesting things, by the way, about this is this particular scripture here, verse 9, is actually quoted in 2 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul quotes this scripture in 2 Corinthians in the New Testament, chapter 9, verse 9. And he's speaking about the fact that, that, to, um, that, that God is pro, uh, blesses those who, who give to him. God is gracious and blesses generosity. Because in that verse, uh, verse 9, he says, He has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, he continues on to say, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. And that's how it works. I mean, we're seeing that take place right now. Those of you who earmarked something for these particular individuals who have been hurt so terribly have actually been doing what verse 9 says to do. And God's promise to you is, is, is given in, in 2 Corinthians 9, 10, and 11, where God is saying, you know what, you have given to me, and in a sense, you are actually lending to me. And in your lending to me, I'm going to, read, I'm going to repay you. Proverbs 19, verse 17 says, He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. Now, as this is taking place, notice verse 10, The wicked will see it and be grieved. You see, when the wicked see God blessing a righteous person, they can actually become jealous. They might even grow angry and resentful. But if they don't turn to the Lord, they're going to die miserably. And that's what he means. He will gnash his teeth and melt away the desire of the wicked shall perish. And finally, Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who dwells on high, who humbles Himself to behold the things that are, on the, are in the heavens and in the earth, he raises the poor out of the dust and lifts up the needy out of the ash heap that he may seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. He grants the barren woman a home like a joyful mother of children. And then he closes, praise the Lord. Again, this is a song of praise, and it begins with praise and concludes with praise. And notice with me, he's saying, praise the Lord as a summons. He's saying, those who love the Lord are, are called to praise him because of his goodness and because of his grace. And God deserves praise, not only just in Israel, but throughout the world, everywhere, he says, from the east to the west. Notice in verses 4 through 6 how he says, the Lord is high above the nations, his glory above the heavens. In other words, there's nothing in the universe that compares to the Lord. His greatness and his glory is unmatched, and yet he humbles himself to behold us and intervenes on our behalf. When the Scripture tells us in verse 6, he humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth, it reminds us of the incarnation, how God took upon himself human flesh and dwelt amongst us. In the book of Philippians, in chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, Paul said it this way, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross." And what does the Lord do? Well, verses 7 through 9 tells us he raises the poor out of the dust. He lifts the needy out of the ash heap. This is what happened for us when we got saved. And I want you to see this. He lifts the needy out of the ash heap that he may seat him with princes. Again, if you don't mind me using an old illustration, but again, these are the things that the Lord spoke to my heart when I was 
a young and growing believer. Many of you have heard this more than once. But it's one of those things in my life that the Lord has used, and I'll, I'll share it with you. My Uncle Louis, the story I've told about my Uncle Louis, I had an uncle, an uncle by the name of Louis Cannon. Louis was from Columbus, Georgia, Southern Drawl. And uh, he married my Aunt Tilly. And um, Uncle Louis was the guy who told me one day when I was a little boy, I came walking into the front room, and, and he was seated there with my dad, and, and I came walking past him, and, and he was a, a real old man to me. He was probably at least 50 years old at that time, and I was probably about eight. And I remember walking in, and Uncle Louie with that old, in his little southern drawl, he looked at me and he said, David, and that's what he used to call me, David, you're the apple of my eye. And I really got upset. I said, man, you know, we talk about no apples. No. And I was mad. I got bugged. I said, what are you calling me names for, you know? And I went into my room, and I was bugged. And my dad walked in and said, what are you so mad about? I said, he's calling me an apple, and I don't like that. And, and you know, I was real sensitive. You know, my, and my dad says to me, oh, son, he says, that, that, that means he loves you. It means you're special to him. I said, really? He says, your Uncle Louie really loves you. Well, Uncle Louie had injured himself on the job, and he couldn't work anymore, and so he had this little pickup truck, and what he would do is he would drive through neighborhoods, and he would stop by the trash cans, and, and he would dig in the trash to find anything that he might be able to take out, and then he'd find something he felt he could repair, and, and he took it, and he would take it into his, uh, in his little workshop that he had there in, behind his home, and, and he would work on that, and he would, he would do whatever he could to repair it, and then he'd go out and he would sell it. And, and, and I was embarrassed by that. I really was. I was embarrassed that my uncle would dig in people's trash. I was embarrassed that he would do those kinds of things. And his craftsmanship had much to be desired. He wasn't really good at what he was doing either, so it was a bit embarrassing in every way. Well, one day I, I wanted a bicycle. I was probably about nine or so, and I had made it very clear. It was a Schwinn bicycle. I wanted a Schwinn. And uh, there was a commercial at that time that said, gee, I like my Schwinn bike. And uh, it was red, and it had some cool tires on it, and it had these little handlebars that had these streamers that would come off. And, man, it was cool, man. When you were going down the street, the streamers would go like that. And, and I started writing notes to my dad because it was close to Christmas, and, and I'd say, gee, I like my Schwinn bike. And, and I would write, uh, I want a red and white bike, and then I want it to have chrome um, wheels. And I described it, and it's a Schwinn bike. And, and so Christmas comes, and... And, and I didn't get my bike, and I'm really upset. I thought for sure I was going to get a bike, and I didn't. And, and my dad says, you know, Uncle, Uncle Louie and Aunt Tilly are coming over to see us today, and he has something for you. And I said, oh, that's, that's nice, you know. And so they show up, and uh, my dad, uh, you know, calls me out of my room. He says, Uncle Louie and Aunt Tilly are here. And I said, well, good. And he says, there's something in the patio for you. And I said, oh, and I thought, all right, my bike. And I go running out, and there it is, red and white, you know, with, with spray chrome, you know. <laughs> he had taken chrome paint and sprayed it. We call it Mexican chrome. He, uh, he sprayed it with silver paint. And he hadn't, he, he, had, he had hand painted it, you know, in red and white, but there were bubbles of rust underneath it because he hadn't prepared the. I was mad. I was so mad. And I said, man, and I, and I looked at it and I was just like, man. I was, <laughs> and, I, and I just stormed off. I went into my room and I'm sitting there with my arms folded, and my dad walks in and he says, your uncle you know, made that bike for you and, and you're not being grateful and he put a lot of work and effort in loving it because he loves you and you ought to be grateful. And I was saying, it's a piece of junk. I don't want to ride it. You ride it. I'm not going to ride that piece of junk. I don't like that. That's not my Schwinn bike. And so, my, oh, my dad, you know, lectured me and I had to go out and say thank you very much even though I didn't <laughs> like the thing, you know. But you know what? 
Uh, I started to drive, I rode the bike in our neighborhood and some kids laughed at me, man. I said, oh, look at that piece of junk, you know? And they did, they said, look at the piece of junk you're riding. And I said, you know what, my uncle loves me and he made this bike for me and I love this bike because he made it for me. My dad had taught me to say that, and you know what, I actually did grow to love that bike. But as I grew older, I grew to love my uncle. He became very special to me because he did the best that he could to give me something he thought I wanted. But the Lord, over the years, taught me something that I've never forgotten. And I've shared this with you before. I was like that bike, torn up and trashed. The enemy used me to the point where he used me up. I was ruined, I was lost, and I was thrown in the trash. And as I was there in the trash, here comes Jesus in this little pickup truck, <laughs> driving through my neighborhood, rummages in the trash, pulls me out, takes me to his shop, but he didn't leave me all bubbled and everything like that. He made me a Schwinn. He started working in my life to make me into something, and the Lord taught me a long time ago, and this is a phrase he gave to me, though it's not, not my own. He says, I take trash and I make them into treasures. That's what the Lord does. He takes trash and he makes it into treasures. The scripture tells us that. Verse 7, he raises the poor out of the dust. He lifts the needy out of the ash heap that he may seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. Not only that, verse 9 says, he grants the barren woman a home like a joyful mother of children. Not only have we been taken out of the trash, but we've been given a family. Like a woman who wanted to have a baby but never could have one, well, the church has become her family. And we have ladies in our fellowship who, though they may not have their own grandchildren or have never had their own child, they have fallen in love with your children. They watch them in the children's ministry. They, they, they nurture them and they care for them and they know them by name and, and they love them and hold them and pray for them because though they may never have had, never have had their own baby, when your baby's brought into that nursery, that baby for that hour and a half, well, that baby becomes their baby. And that's very special. And we have a lot of ladies like that in this church who find their joy in having a family. And this church is their family. And your kids become their kids. And they know them and love them and pray for them like a doting grandma might do for their baby. And I've seen a lot of that in this church. And so what God does is he takes you out of the trash. He makes you a treasure. He gives you a family because he loves you. And if we could only understand that today, we'd serve him with more gratefulness. We'd serve him with more joy, and we would serve him with more, more energy. May we do that even beginning today.